Alrighty. In Revelation chapter number one tonight, what we're going to be doing is, Lord willing, we'll be getting into another of our sacred secrets. And uh, it's been probably a month or more since we looked at one. Last time we looked at the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Um, but today we're going to try, key word being try there, uh, we're going to try to look at one more that the Lord has revealed in His Scripture. And He revealed it in a vision to a man named John. So let's begin in chapter 1 and just to get the context in verse number 4. We find out the author and who he is writing to. In verse number 4 the Bible says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And I know you all, many of you have heard about these churches. Uh, he is writing to seven literal, physical, local churches that existed in Asia. If you were to look on a map right now, all seven of these churches that he's writing to would be found in what you and I refer to as the country Turkey. It would be within that area of the world. And so he's speaking to these real churches. Now listen, they had real people. They had real problems. They had real pastors, real, real uh, victories and failures in their life. And we could look even into chapter 2 and 3 uh, where he writes specifically a message to each of these seven churches. He rebukes many of them. He, co he compliments many of them. And that's not what we're going to be doing tonight. But I want us to go down and read in verse number 10 now. Verse number 10, we're going to read about this vision that the Lord gives to the Apostle John. Verse 10 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and, a, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. That is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Amen? And what we're about to see is the physical presentation of Jesus to John in this vision. I heard a preacher one time preaching out of these verses. He was actually preaching against men wearing shorts. And he looked at these verses and he said, See, Jesus is clothed down to the foot, and that means the closer that your foot, your garment is to your foot, the more like Jesus you're dressed. That's what he said. The next part of the verse says, And his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. So I guess the whiter your hair is, the closer you are to Jesus as well. Isn't that right? I don't know where that leaves Brother Shane and Brother Nick. I'm sorry, guys, but uh, real far away from Jesus, I guess. I'm not sure. Uh, but this is what Jesus looked like. If you look down there in verse 14, it says, And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Verse 15, And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand, notice this, he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And so John sees this vision. It is of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. He, is, he has the appearance that we saw, a sword coming out of his mouth. He has these seven stars in his right hand. And he is surrounded by these seven candlesticks. All right? Verse number 17. That, that, so that's the vision. Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. A big amen goes right there. He, Jesus knew an amen went right there. That's why he amened himself. All right? Amen himself. He said, I'm alive forevermore. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now please focus in on verse number 20. The, excuse me, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angel's of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. 
So in these verses we find another biblical mystery that is revealed to us. And as I've defined, a biblical mystery is not, uh, contrary to what one would think, something that God does not want you to know. It is, and we've called it an old truth, newly revealed, right? It is something that through the writing of the New Testament, now uh, everyone should know about, right? And it's, you, it's my job and it's your job as Christians and as stewards of the mysteries of God to understand these truths and then relay them to the world around us. Um, and so we've titled this mystery, The Mystery of the Churches, all right? The Mystery of the Churches. And so he is writing this vision down, and God tells him to give this vision to these seven different local churches. And now many people have said, and I would tend to agree, that these seven churches, they uh, represent seven types of churches, and that each church would fall within that spectrum or one of the seven, right? You're either Laodicea being on the worse end or Philadelphia being on the better end. And I sure don't want to be Laodicea, amen? I want to be Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the two only churches where Jesus didn't have anything negative to say, had nothing bad to say to them. And so I would love to be that, amen? I don't, I, I, listen, I think when I look around and I look at myself especially, there's a lot of bad things to say. Uh, but we can always strive to be better, amen? We can always strive to be more for Christ and be more like that Philadelphia church. Others also believe that these seven churches represent seven church age uh, periods, if you will. Seven different periods of time throughout the church age history, and they place us in Laodicea. Now, y'all remember Laodicea is that church where Jesus is on the outside, he's knocking, trying to get in, and everybody on the inside is saying, we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now, does that not sound like the church of our day? Don't need Jesus, we've got big buildings, right? We don't need Jesus, we've got big bank accounts. We don't need Jesus, we have all these programs. We've, we've got it all figured out, and we really don't need Jesus. We're rich, and we're increased with goods and have need of nothing. And Jesus tells them, you don't even know that you are poor and miserable and blind and naked. They thought they, all, they had it all figured out. And listen, those folks that feel like they got it all figured out are the ones who've got the most to figure out. Amen? They're the ones that have, have, have a problem with God because of their pride. And so we definitely don't want to be Laodicea, but I would agree with that, uh, that, that, uh, interpretation of these verses being the historical pa uh, periods of time throughout the church age. And so he sees this vision, seven candlesticks, Jesus in the midst. He sees what Jesus looks like, and Jesus has seven stars in his right hand. And then in verse 20, uh, we find our first point, which is the description of this mystery. Jesus sees fit to interpret the mystery for us very plainly. He says that the seven stars, look in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels uh, of the church. Excuse me. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So there's some debate about who these angels are. And let me tell you if you've ever heard this. Have you ever heard anybody say that each church has their own angel? Has anybody ever heard that? I've, I've heard that a lot. That's a common interpretation of these verses, is that when he says that in his right hand are the angels of the seven churches, meaning each church has an angel. And, you know, maybe that's uh, the case. I'm not sure. I lean towards another interpretation, and that is that these angels of the churches are the pastors of the churches. They're in the right hand. That word angel literally means messenger. Okay? Messenger. Actually, take your Bible, look in chapter 2 in verse number 1. Look, look, if God is going to speak to this church, look how he does so. Chapter 2, verse number 1. It says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. Jesus is speaking to the angel, the messenger, to then speak to the church. Chapter 2, verse number 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. Verse 12, and to the angel of the church of, in Pergamos, right. On and on and on we could go. All of the messages that God had for the churches, he sent through the messenger. Uh, that sounds like a pastor to me, right? I mean, that, that, would y'all not agree? That's what that sounds like. Uh, he, he gets a message from God, and he's supposed to relay that message uh, to the people. He's just a messenger. Hey, don't shoot the messenger, right? It's just the person preaching the word of God. It's not his words. It's Jesus' words. 
So many people get mad at the preacher when they really should get mad at God, right? Because, because the, the goal, the idea, and listen, preachers are liable to get up and share things that God did not tell them to say. We've all heard that, right? That does happen. Uh, but, if, but if a preacher gets in the pulpit, don't care who it is, if they get in the pulpit and they've got a chapter and verse, you have no reason to take any exception to or to get angry with them. Right. It's, it's just the message. It's just, he's just saying what God said. And so God is speaking to these angels, and I, I hope that's the interpretation because, praise the Lord, those seven angels are in his right hand. Amen? Uh, Jesus has control. Jesus is the one protecting and guarding and guiding and then speaking through uh, these angels of these seven churches. But what I'm really interested in tonight is the, the churches themselves. It says in the last part of verse 20 that, if you want to look there in verse number 20, uh, he says that the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So what you and I have in a local church, is everybody with me? You and I have a local church that we're in right now, Resurrection Baptist Church, okay? The church is a gift to you. The church is a gift to me. God allows you and I to operate in and to flourish in and to grow and to attend and to participate in a local church. And that's what these seven candlesticks are. They are these seven local churches. Now what Jesus is saying in chapter 1 would have been very strange to a Jewish audience. Remember, the Jews are used to uh, the presence of God. Remember, Jesus is in the midst of these churches. The Jews were used to the presence of God and, and the worship of God being delegated to and relegated to a tabernacle or a temple or the Ark of the Covenant. There's this one specific location in which Jesus said that I'm going to put my name there and I'm going to show up above the mercy seat and all those things. They say, he says, my presence is tied in the Old Testament to this location, to this place. But now in the New Testament, we find out Jesus is doing something different. Now Jesus is showing up at the local church. Right? He's showing up at the church. Which is one of the reasons why uh, I have a hard time accepting the fact that somebody could be saved by the grace of God, but not want to have anything to do with a local church. The vision was not that John saw Jesus in the deer stand. Right? Right? Or that John saw Jesus on his bass boat. Or that John saw Jesus in his pajamas watching football on Sunday. Come on now, help me out a little bit. He said, I saw Jesus and he was in the midst of the churches. A, a physical representation, a, a place where he can show up, where he can show out, where he can work and move. And listen, I know Jesus is with us everywhere. We're indwelt by the Spirit of God. I understand that. But this verse clearly says that when John saw Jesus in this dispensation of time, he saw him in the midst of these local churches. So God has a role for the local church in my life and in your life. And that's why you and I should be faithful to church. I don't preach on church attendance often, but when I do, I try to hit it really hard. All right? We should be here. John said, I saw him, and he was right there, and he was right in the midst of those, of those seven local New Testament independent fundamental Baptist churches. All right? I'm just sure that was what they were. I'm confident of that. So that's the description uh, of these, this mystery, the mystery of the churches. Secondly, let's look at the disguise of the mystery of the churches. I, we've told you that these are not new truths. This isn't something that Jesus just, come, that just came up with in Revelation chapter 1. This is something, listen, the New Testament local church, what you and I are a part of today, was always in the heart and mind of God. All right? This was God's plan from the beginning. God don't have any plan Bs. Okay? It's plan A. Everything's plan A with God. And so it was God's will to establish these local New Testament churches that you and I are a part of. And so the, the question then becomes, well, where is this truth about the churches in the Old Testament? If it's an eternal truth, where can we find it uh, in disguise is what we've called it. And we can find out a good hint in our text. I told you that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. I believe when you see a candlestick in the Bible, 
oftentimes it is a picture and a type of the church. In fact, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Exodus chapter 25, please. Exodus chapter 25. While you're turning, I know there's going to be a lot of teaching tonight, and so I hope everybody will just hang with me for a little while. Um, but while you're turning, these candlesticks that we see in Revelation 1, I don't want you to think of just one flame. All right? These candlesticks that he's seeing are what you and I would call menorahs, okay? It, which is described, we're going to read about it now in Exodus chapter 25, but it is a candlestick, there's one candle in the middle, and then there's three that come out to this side and three that come out to that side, forming these seven lamps on one candlestick. Um, and in this passage of Scripture, we're going to find out that the church is in disguise in the candlestick. In verse number 8, we find out what the purpose is. Uh, of the candlestick is in the sanctuary is look in verse number eight he says and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them God wants to dwell with his people I praise the Lord for that amen brother Jay mentioned the verse while he was uh, praying earlier you know what is man that thou art mindful of him who are you who are, who are you and who am I that Jesus would want to show up and meet with us at church we don't deserve that right but, but, but what God has always wanted from man is a relationship, is what we read about in 1 John tonight, fellowship, right? God makes Adam, and he walks with him in the cool of the day. There's this communion, there's this relationship and this fellowship, and that relationship and fellowship is always hindered by sin, and that's why if you've got sin in your life, you better get it right with God, because God wants to fellowship with you. He wants to dwell with you. He wants to commune with you. And he tells them here in Exodus 25, build me this sanctuary, this meeting house, where I can dwell with you and spend time with you. Now look down in verse number 31. Verse number 31 of Exodus chapter 25. We're going to find the church in disguise in this candlestick. The Bible says in verse number 31, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shafts... His shaft and his branches and his bowls and his knops, his flowers shall be of the same. The fact that this candlestick is of pure gold, that denotes the value and the worth and the purity of the local church. That's what that represents, the fact that this candlestick is of pure gold. Also, another thing about this candlestick, it says that it is, not, it is supposed to be of beaten work. You know how people normally work with metals like this, especially hot ones you don't want to touch? They pour it into a mold, right? You'd pour something into a mold and then crack it open and then you have this cookie cut of whatever the mold is. He tells them here, hey, the candlestick's not supposed to be made like that. It's supposed to be beaten out of one solid piece of gold. It's beaten work. You know what that would do? That would cause each of these uh, candlesticks, if you will, these menorahs, to be individual. There's not going to be another one just like it. Listen, every church is different. Every church is different. E everyone has its own little intricacies, and there are things in common. They're supposed to be the bowl, they're supposed to be the knops and the flowers, and, and all that's supposed to be specifically arranged and all of that, but, but this piece is going to be individual, and there's not going to be anyone, uh, any other one just like it. And if you go to any different church, if you've ever been a part of a different church, you understand each church is different. God moves in a certain way, and God might have things organized in a certain way because of the specific people that are here. Listen, if, there, if there's nobody else like you, then there's no other church like this one. Right? Does that make sense? If there's no other person like you, and you go to this church, that means there'll be no other church like this church. I'm glad that God knows exactly what we need. He can deal with us personally, he can deal with us individually, he can help us uh, in the church. And that's what this is a picture of, the fact that there are no cookie-cut churches. Amen. Verse number 32. Verse 32, and says, And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Um, that would make seven in all, one in the middle and three on both sides. Verse 34. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. The bowls that he's speaking of were that were looked like almonds. That is a reservoir 
where they would put the olive oil in to keep the lamp burning. Okay, So these, this lamp was never supposed to go out, and it had to have this olive oil, and there's specific instructions as to how the olive oil is supposed to be made, and they were supposed to fill it and constantly keep it filled to keep this lamp burning. These knops and flowers... Those are decorative pieces uh, that God told for them to put there. Verse number 35, it says, And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick, their knops and their branches shall be of the same. All of it shall be one beaten work of pure gold, and thus thou, and thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, and they may give light over against it. All the way, I want you to think about this. All the way back in the book of Exodus that we just read about in chapter 25, as God is constructing the tabernacle and he is giving them instructions for how to build all these different pieces of furniture, think about this, God had you in mind. God had the New Testament church in mind. And this is a picture of it. He's teaching us things about it through this candlestick. It's representing that. Do you know that the candlestick that we just read about was the only source of light in the tabernacle. It was the only source of light that there was. There were no windows. That meant if you were going to get to the most holy place and sacrifice the blood, you needed the light of the candlestick. If you were going to go to that laver and, and wash your hands, if you were going to go to that table of showbread and, and, and all that, if you were going to do anything that related to God and to His service and to His worship, you needed the candlestick. You know what God is doing in our day and time? He's operating through the candlesticks. He's operating through local New Testament churches. Listen, I'm a local church man. If God is doing something right now, He's doing it in and through the local church. That's why if God is going to do something in our area, He's going to use us to do it. Amen? Or He's going to use some other uh, church to do it. He's operating and moving through the churches. That should Number one, we should rejoice in that and be thankful God's even willing to use us to do anything. But number two, that should place on us an obligation to understand that if God's going to do something, He wants to use you and I to do it. Amen. Again, it was the only source of light that there was. Is what Jesus Christ was doing and what, what this oil was doing through uh, this lamp. And I, I'm, I'm looking, I, listen, I'm looking to be used of God in the same way that this candlestick was. I'm looking for Resurrection Baptist Church to be used in the same way that this candlestick was in the tabernacle. If you were going to get to that most holy place where the blood was applied, you needed the light of that candlestick. Listen, if this world is going to find out who Jesus is, if they're going to see the way to heaven, the way to approach God, you and I, the candlestick, the church of Jesus Christ, have to shine that light to them. He wants to use us to do it. Amen? Not only in the tabernacle. Please take your Bible and turn to Zechariah chapter 4, please. Zechariah chapter 4. If you find Matthew, you go back to the left two books, all right? It's the second to last book in your Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 4. We're talking about the mystery of the churches and how that they're pictured in these, these candlesticks in, your, in the Word of God. In Zechariah chapter 4, while you're turning, I'll give you a little context to the book. Remember, the southern kingdom of Judah was... Uh, taken over by Babylon, and then Babylon is eventually taken over by Media Persia. And then, if, and you find this in the book of Ezra, um, the king, king Cyrus there in the book of Ezra, he decides to allow them to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, He, he, he allows them to do that. Uh, that's around Nehemiah's day. They rebuild the walls, and Ezra is a part of that, rebuilding the temples, Zerubbabel, and all those guys. They're rebuilding the temple. And in the process of rebuilding the temple... Um, they get discouraged. You can go and read in the book of Ezra, particularly in chapter 4, about what happened there. They got discouraged. People were trying to stop the work of God. They got depressed. And then there was political upheaval back in Persia. And so they ended up having to stop the work of God. And when that happened, God raised up two prophets to preach to them. And one of them was Zechariah. And so the, the way, verses we're going to read, they, they're found in that context. And what he is encouraging them to do is to finish what they started. 
continue, keep going, and do what God has called for them to do. Look in chapter 4 and verse number 1. He is going to have a vision as well of a candlestick. Verse number 1. It says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that wakeneth, excuse me, that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top of it, top thereof, and two olive trees by it, the one upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left there, side thereof. I want you to think about, I want you to picture this in your mind, all right? The candlestick that we saw in Exodus 25, each one, each of those seven different branches had a bowl that held oil, and they were supposed to keep oil in those bowls to keep each flame burning. That was in Exodus 25. In Zechariah chapter 4, the candlestick's not made like that. In, in Zechariah 4, this candlestick has one bowl at the top, which is being fed by two olive trees on either side. And then from that bowl, there are these pipes that are going to the seven branches. And you're sitting there thinking, what in the world does that have to do with the New Testament church? Look down in verse number 4. Verse number 4. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The message to Zerubbabel is this. I don't need your power. I don't need your might. You're not going to operate in your own strength. He says, you're going to complete the temple by my spirit. That oil in the bowl represents the Holy Spirit. That's what this is saying. That there is a never-ending supply of the Spirit of God that's going to be put in this bowl and then furnished out to these candlesticks which represent you and I. Are y'all getting this? You and I have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us like they didn't have in the Old Testament. You and I, the Bible says, have rivers, right, of water flowing up into everlasting life. You and I are indwelt by the Spirit of God. They were not. And so we have an unending supply. We have all that we need to do the work of God that He's called for us to do. This candlestick is a picture of the New Testament church. It's as good of one as you'll find in the Word of God. This Zachariah's candlestick here in chapter number 4, he sees a picture of what you and I are today. And that's what Jesus is likening back to in Revelation chapter 1. He's saying those churches are candlesticks, but they don't have those individual bowls on all the branches. There's a bowl on top with an unlimited supply. I'm glad that it's not all up to me. I'm not having to operate, are y'all with me tonight? I'm not having to operate in my own power, my own intellect, my own thoughts, my strength. I have the Holy Spirit of God. This church has the Holy Spirit of God that can minister through us and can build the temple. It can, it can build the kingdom of God. It can do what our power and our might and our strength cannot do. There are a lot of churches today who may have big buildings, they may have tons of programs, they may have lots of money, they may have lots of influence, but they have it by, according to verse number 6, by might and by power and not by the Spirit of Christ. I'd rather have the Spirit of God and not have any of that other stuff, wouldn't you? Amen. That, that's what the local church is supposed to be about. It's about allowing the Spirit of God to minister through all of us to the world around us. To do just like Zerubbabel was doing. Zerubbabel, they're trying to build the temple. You and I are building the kingdom of God through the unlimited supply of the Spirit of God. Are y'all seeing this? This is the church in disguise. This is local New Testament churches in disguise in this picture of Zerubbabel in the Old Testament. That is the disguise. Now take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to see the disclosure of of the mystery of the churches, or when was this truth first exposed or revealed? I believe we can find uh, the seed of this truth being revealed 
in the Sermon on the Mount. Look in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 14. Hopefully here in just a minute y'all will see all these things kind of come together. I know I'm throwing a lot out at y'all. Look in verse number 14 of Matthew chapter 5. That's what Jesus said. Remember, the church is, the church is in mind. Verse number 14. He says, Ye are the light of the world. Y'all know who he's speaking to? He's speaking to the apostles. Okay? He's speaking to the apostles. Y'all know what the apostles are eventually going to become? The foundation of the church. Amen? Acts chapter 2, birthday of the church. Peter's up there preaching. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 soldiers saved. That, that, that the apostles are the ones who gave us church doctrine. They're the ones who author, authored the New Testament to us. I mean, they're the ones that he worked through to shine light of the New Testament to this world. The apostles. And he tells them, ye are the light of the world. He says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He says, neither do men light a what? A candle. And put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He's speaking to these apostles who represent us. They're the, they're the foundation of the church. And he tells them that you are a candle on a candlestick, and you have to shine light to the world, and then he tells them to sh let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now the light that this candlestick is shining, that these apostles are shining, is not their own light. The message that you and I have to share with this world is not about us. It's not our own light. It's not something that we came up with. We are supposed to be shining the light of Christ to this world, right? John chapter 8, Jesus spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. You and I are just the candles. Amen? We're, we're what, we are what God sets on fire and allows to burn so that this world can see the truth about who Jesus is. That's our job. It's not to point people to ourselves. It's so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven, not us. I think a lot of churches need to get a hold of that, don't you? It's not about trying to impress other people. It's not about trying to, how, to see how, how much better you can be than the church down the road. Listen, I'm not trying to be involved in any of that. It's about glorifying our Father which is in heaven. It's about you and I being that candlestick that God can set on fire, that His Spirit can minister through, and they can see Jesus Christ. Amen? The disclosure of this mystery. And lastly, I want to say something about the design of the mystery of the churches. Or what is, you ever thought about this? What is the purpose of the local New Testament church? What I've talked to y'all about tonight, I'm, I'm almost done. What I've talked to y'all about tonight is essentially a conflict between light and darkness, right? Light and darkness. First words that God spoke, the first recorded words in your Bible, right? Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, right? There's this from the very onset of the Word of God. The first words in your Bible were that was that God was establishing light, creating light to go against the darkness. Throughout the Old Testament, we could turn, and I don't have time, but we could turn to Genesis chapter 15. That's Genesis chapter 1. We could look in Genesis chapter 15, right, where Abram makes his covenant with God, and he lays out the sacrifice, and there's these, uh, God shows up in the person of a burning lamp and smoking flax. And passes between, you know what that is? That is a picture of the nation of Israel being the light to the world that passes through the darkness of that sacrifice. They're going to go through Egyptian bondage. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to wander in the wilderness. All of these things are going to happen in the nation of Israel. But you know what Israel was? It was a light to the world that said, there is a God in Israel. God used Israel to shine the light of who he was in the Old Testament. You know what you and I are supposed to do? You know what the purpose of the local New Testament church is? To continue that ministry of shining the light to this world. Amen?
God didn't save you for you to sit on your thumb. God didn't save you for us to just, just get, get comfortable and just to be complacent and just keep our hands in our pockets and not do nothing for God. No, listen, you and I are supposed to be lights that shine the truth of the gospel to this world. Amen. That's the purpose of the New Testament church. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, it tells us that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, listen, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The lost reside in darkness, and it's our job to shine the light. Being God's candlesticks, if you will. Down here in the south, there's a whole lot of candlesticks around. Right? There's a whole bunch of other good, there's a bunch of other good Baptist churches right here in Cowpens. I think the I think the attendance of the Baptist churches in Cowpens is larger than the population of the town of Cowpens. If you added them all up, I'm pretty sure it is. I think the population is about 2,000. There's more than 2,000 members of all these Baptist churches just in Cowpens. You know what I say to that? Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank God there's some light. And you go out into other places where there are not as many churches around, guess what you find? More darkness. Why is that? There's not as many candlesticks. There's not as many candlesticks. The, the, the Spirit of God, that never-ending supply, the Spirit of God that re re resides in the believer is not able to operate and not able to illuminate as much as it can in here, in our area. Listen, that's why I thank God for the church. Because if it wasn't for the church, I'd be in darkness. If it wasn't for the fact that there were some people who got saved by the grace of God, filled with the Spirit of God, and then allowed God to shine through them to me, I'd be lost and on my way to hell, and you would be too. I thank God that Jesus is in the midst of these candlesticks. Listen, I want Jesus in the midst of this candlestick. The Resurrection Baptist Church, don't you? I want this to be a place where His presence is. What did Jesus say? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I don't want them on the outside knocking, trying to get in. He needs to be the emphasis. He needs to be the focal point. He needs to be the main thing in this candlestick. Amen? By the grace of God, He will be. Let's ask for God to help us to be the candlestick that He wants for us to be. I believe that God wants every saved person to be an active, faithful participant in a local church. Every one of them. To be a faithful, active participant in the local church. We've got ministries here, things that we do, right? When we're praying, through, through, through attendance, through giving, we've got nursing home ministries, we've got outreach ministries. We, we, you and I, every single day, uh, when we go out into this community, we're participating in the ministry of this church. Now, I think a lot of us have taken that light and done like Jesus said, uh, people put it under a bushel. They hide it. They want to dampen it. They, they don't want people to see the truth through them. They'd rather blend in to the darkness. By the help and grace of God, our church is not going to blend in with the darkness. We're going to shine bright. We're going to allow the Spirit of God and that never-ending supply, that bowl on the top of Zachariah's candlestick. We're going to have the Spirit of God operating through us and ministering to this community through this local church. Amen? Praise God for the mystery of the churches. Let's pray.